All right, the last video, you guys, we talked about building our models. And as part of building the models, we created something called a migration. I talked a little bit about what the migrations were. They're kind of step-by-step -step instructions that allow Laravel to recreate database tables and database structures um, without us having to do it kind of on the side. So that way we can do the database management within Laravel, which is a really, really handy thing to do, especially when you're working with a team of people. Now this video is going to pick up exactly where the other one left off. In fact, this was part of one large video that I decided to cut into two pieces. So we're going to pick up right where we walked, right where we left off on the last video. If you haven't caught up on that video and you want to, go ahead. Um, I've got a, a picture right here where you can that you can click and go back to that video, or a link in the description will take you to the previous video as well. Um, but like I said, we created a model and created a migration with our model, and that's exactly where we pick up in this video is looking at that migration so we can kind of complete that process of getting our model set up to start working with and start storing our posts. Okay, now the migration is stored under the database folder. I'm going to close app. So database and then migrations. And then you can see we have a couple other ones here, which is very interesting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just scroll over so you can see it. You can see there's a create users table, create password resets table, and create post table. Now we know about the one we created here, create post table, but there's these two other ones that we have. So let's go ahead and just open those and take a look at them. Okay, well here you can see that we've created a create users table. It extends migration. Once again, Laravel's created a class for migration. We get all the power of that migration class built in by simply extending it, okay? Um, and then here you can see we have a function for up and a function for down. Let's go ahead and just read these real quick. It says schema create users function, okay? And then we have um, table increments ID a string named name, a string named email, a string named password, a remember token, and timestamps, okay? What this is doing is creating our database table, all right? So if we look at this, um, you can see that we're creating a table called users, all right? And then within the users table, we're going to make a column that is called ID, and it's simply the primary ID. It's the incremental numbers. We're going to create a name column, and that name column is going to store a string. We're going to create an email column that's going to also store a string, a password column with a maximum of 60 characters in the password column, and that's also a string. And then we're going to have a column for remember token, which is kind of a built-in class for Laravel, and then another one for timestamps, which the timestamps simply creates two columns, one for created at and one for updated at that Laravel knows how to handle automatically. Okay, so it's creating a table with that structure automatically. And then you can see there's a down function that says drop users. Well, the way migrations work is we can move migrations forward or backwards. So as we uh, migrate our database, it's going to go ahead and create a users table with this type of structure. We can also roll back a migration and say, oh, we didn't want to do that. And what what it'll do then is it'll run the down function, which drops the table, basically deleting the table, and we no longer have a user's table. This allows us to build and unbuild our database incrementally, right? We can do it for just this migration, or we have three, two other migrations, three total, and we can do certain migrations and not other ones. This is really, really helpful, it's meaning we can build up our database. If we make a mistake, we can pull back just one step of it and then maybe you know rerun it and stuff like that. Now, as you can see here, that this is basically allowing us to create an authentication service, which we're going to go ahead and create this table, but we're not going to set up the authentication service automatically. All right, but just know that we're creating a table now for users. And if you go back to our model up here, this model users, you can see we, we'll learn about this stuff soon, but it's basically accept, expecting a name, an email, and a password. And um, that corresponds to the user table down here. All right, so really, really useful. Um, and then we can see that we also have another table created, and this is for our um, 
uh, password resets table. This handles all of our password resets. Again, it's got a column for the email, a column for a token, and then a created at column, all right? So that's basically what it's created, and it's gonna create another table. So by the time we're done here, we're gonna have three tables, password resets, users, and uh, posts, okay? And this is, by going back, Again, we're not going to get into authentication yet, but we will soon. We're going to use the built-in, well, uh, the Laravel's built-in authentication. But that's one of the things that's really cool. Laravel has a built-in authentication system. All of these are created when we did our Laravel new project. It created all these things so that we can have authentication built right into our application. Okay, so we're not going to have it enabled yet, but we're going to have all the structure there and in. A few videos down the road, we'll set up authentication so that we have a login system and um, we'll set that up and then, so we'll have all the structure now and we'll set it up and start implementing it into our app later. Okay, let's go ahead and look at this last migration, which is a create posts table. So here you can see we said create post table, it extends migration, we've got another public up function. Once again, Laravel, when we did our command over here, this uh, model post and then added the migration, it knew so much about what we were doing, it went ahead and just started filling it in for us. So here you can see it created, it knows we're gonna, or it's expecting us to have some that primary ID, and it's also expecting us to have timestamps, okay? So let's go ahead and um, work with this a little bit. Let's do, um, what we can do is we can start adding our own columns that we want. So let's actually come back over to our database here. Um, did I save that? I didn't save it. Uh, I've got it over here. Okay. Okay, so here's the database that we were working with before. We had talked about creating an ID. Well, it looks like Laravel has already created an ID column, so we're set. Um, next, the timestamps, as I mentioned earlier, creates two columns, created at and updated at, all right? So it creates both of those columns. So we're actually set right here as well, which means we just need to create a column for title and a column for body. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, I'm gonna pull this up real quick, is that if you've never worked with databases, databases columns need specific types um, of information. You kind of have to tell it what type of information to expect to be stored in that column. In the case of an ID, you're saying it's always gonna be a whole number. It's an integer, right, or an int. Just like we do with PHP, how we'll say, hey, this is an int, we're gonna say the same thing with, um, with uh, databases, right? Um, the title is gonna be a string. And you saw that in our last with our users model, you could see how it defined a certain column as a string, and that's what we would do here. So a title is always gonna be a string of text. Um, and the one thing to know about a string is that a string is can only hold up to 255 characters, okay? So um, for our body, it's most likely gonna be more than 255 characters. So then we have to look into a new another thing that's called text. And this is for long form text, okay? And um, this allows us to even store things like format it, formatting, if you wanted to like say bold a section in our blog post. The well, databases don't actually store rich text. They only store plain text, which means you can't bold something really in a database. What you'd have to do is you have to create um, like HTML tags to indicate that that's going to be bolded. So what we would do is around the bolded text, you would actually save a strong tag on the front and on the end of that bolded text, and then save it as plain text into the database. Then when we pull it out of the database, we would render it as if those um, are relevant. So we would then turn the strong tags into bolded text, right? Like HTML. Um, so this isn't gonna need more than 255 characters. So we're gonna use the other type of string, which is a long form text, it's called text. And then there's these which are called date times. Okay, these store both a date and a time in them. Now you can see here we're only showing the time, but in Laravel um, and in our database, we'll see in a second, it's actually gonna store the date and the time together in one column. And so those are called um, date time. And both of these are date time columns. Now you can also store just date and just time if you want. It's called, it, it's called time and called date and um, our date date time, or it's called timestamp and date stamp, and there's date timestamp. And so we're almost always gonna use date time, and that stores both the date and the time, okay? So this is what we're gonna create. So these have been created, this has been created, we just need to create a string called title and a text called body. So let's go ahead and do that. So under after our ID, let's go ahead and we're gonna say table, 
we always need to do the table object because you can see that that's created right here for us. So table object, we're gonna call it a string because that's what type it is. And we're gonna call that, type, that um, column title, okay? Okay, now one other thing I wanna show you guys, if you were wondering what kind of like options you have here for like string and increments and stuff like that, I wanna show you here, if you go to the Laravel, um, I think it's laravel.com, Okay, so you go to Laravel and you go into the documentation and there is a schema, what they call it schema markup. So let's look for schema here. Okay, it's under database migrations. That's what it's called. Okay, so go under database migrations. It's going to talk a little bit about what we're doing right now, actually, if you want to learn more about migrations. There's so much I could talk to you guys about, but I don't want to waste too much time. Um, I'm just going to talk about the necessity, the real necessities. Here it does say you can make just a migration. If you don't want to create a model in a migration like we did, you can create, instead of doing make model, you can just do make migration and it only creates a migration. Okay, um, what I want to do is come all the way down here to where there's schema. Here it is right here. So it's available column types and this tells you all the different column types that we can use here. So we have increments and string and if you're wondering what other options you have, it tells you what all of the options are here. You can do big increments, big integers, booleans, characters, dates. I mentioned how we had date stamps. There's date time stamps. Time stamps I'm sure are down here because it's in alphabetical order. Here's a time stamp. Um, and then it tells you here that if you just do the time stamps with the parentheses, it creates a created at and updated at columns, okay? So all that information is here. So if you're wondering where I get this, I use the Laravel dot com my um, documentation all of the time now you can see here that the one that we want is called text it creates a text equivalent in a database and you can see how the string creates a var car equivalent in the database if you haven't worked with databases yet you should know that my we're working with a mysql database and in mysql there are um it called it doesn't use the word string we call a column type is called a var car which is what you see here um, and var cars are variable characters. It means it's a string of characters with a variable amount. What's nice about that is that you can, um, we can actually define if it's only going to be say 10, 10, we only want 10 numbers. If you saw in the password we'd looked at earlier, it was maxed out at 60 characters. We don't want any more than 60 characters in that database. This saves a lot of space because it knows the database can say, hey, that column doesn't need all this memory. It only needs a little bit of memory because it's only saving 60 characters or 10 characters. And when you have tens of thousands or millions of column or of rows in your database, that adds up a ton. Okay, so that's why variable characters are exist. And so strings are going to be var cars. And then text is basically an, a long uh, amount of text. And that's what we're going to use here. So you can see here table, text, description, and that's going to work there. Now there's other stuff we can do here called column modifiers. And um, this allows, the one I use the most often is nullable and default. Now nullable means by default, when Laravel work creates a, a column in a database, it um, makes it, it does not make it nullable. What that means is it does not accept null, meaning it, it has to have an item. It's a required column. So that's every column you make in this Laravel is going to be required by default. If you don't want it to be required, if you're okay with that, um, with an entry not having something in that column, what you can do is you can simply add onto the column nullable like this. And that'll say that a title is optional, basically. And don't throw an error if someone doesn't give you a title. Now, there's it really depends on what you're doing. You may or may not want these. If we were working with, say, tags, let's say we're making a column for tags, that's optional, right? I don't care if someone doesn't want tags. We would make that one nullable because it may not have any tags related to a post. In the case of a title, we're going to make title and body both required. So we're not going to worry about it right now. Um, another thing is if you want to um, set a default value, so if someone doesn't give you a value for an, a database entry, um, but you don't want it to be nullable, you want it to be set to maybe true by default, but unless they tell you it's going to be false, well, you can also set a default value and you just add, same just like we did nullable, you add default and then you pass in the value that you want the default value to be. So um, you could do this with a string too. If we wanted our default string to be... Um, 
default, and you wanted the default string to be uh, no title given, right? It still is not nullable. It still requires an entry, but that's okay because if no one gives you an entry, we're just gonna set it to the default value, which is no title given, right? Doesn't make sense in this case, but I just wanna give you an example of how it would work. Um, the last one I use often is with numbers. You can use unsigned. Again, if you don't know what databases are, this might sound weird, but um, there are signed numbers and unsigned numbers when you're storing like integers and floats into databases. A signed integer means it can accept a negative or a positive value. So you could have negative 255 all the way up to positive 255 for a, a small integer. Um, larger integers can accept more numbers than that. So, but um, that's kind of how they work. Um, with unsigned, it allows us to not have a negative. It means everything is gonna be positive. There's not gonna be a, a plus or a negative at the um, beginning of that number. That's what unsigned is. So unsigned is sometimes good because it uses half the memory of a signed integer. If you think about it, once again, let's think of an integer and the database is thinking, okay, the number could be anything between one and 255. That saves less memory than if it were saying, well, it could be anything from negative 255 to positive 255. That means all the negative numbers to zero and then from zero up to 255, it uses twice as much memory, okay? So just think about that. Sometimes if you know you're gonna use positive numbers only, then having unsigned can save a lot of memory. In big projects, that makes a difference, okay? Um, and then the last thing is if you are using MySQL, this one's only available in MySQL, if you want a certain order column, you could do that. So for example, if you wanted to, this is mainly useful if you're adding a column down the road and you want to put that column like in the middle. If um, Let's come back over to our column here. Let's say we're creating a tags column and I want the tags column to be right here in between body and created at. Well, I could create, what I would do is I would create um, table and I would call it, we'll just call it an integer for now and then um, tags and then we would set an after and then we could just tell it after the body tag. So we do after body and then that would create the tags column but it would set it after the body and so then it would fit in right here. That's not super important but I do use it actually um, occasionally. Okay, okay so let's um, go ahead and create our last one, table text and we're gonna call this one um, uh, body, right? <laughs> I have brain fart there. Okay, so body. Okay, so just like we learned, that's everything. All of these are required, remember that, because we didn't set nullable, so by default it's required, and that's okay, because we want, it doesn't make sense to have a title, a blog post without a title, or a blog post without a body. We're gonna require both of those. However, down the road, as we add more features, we might make some of those features um, optional, and in that case, we would add that nullable to the end of them. So um, there we go, we can go ahead and save this file like I have. And now we're gonna go ahead and actually create the database or create the model. Now in order to do that, what we need to do is tell Laravel how to connect to our database. And in order to do that, you need to have a database installed in your computer. So this is where it might get a little tricky. Now I, I believe in our setting up Laravel series, we talked about having MySQL installed. And by default, we're gonna be using MySQL Laravel. Um, MySQL is a great database. It's my favorite one to work with. I also do work with other databases, but MySQL is definitely the easiest to learn on, and it's kind of the most forgiving, I would say. Um, now, what we want to do here to tell Laravel how to connect to our database is we need to first of all go into our configuration file. So it's under env. If you go to .env here, um, this is an environmental file. What this means is that um, you can see here that the app environment is local. So when we're set to our local environment, which we are right now, we are, um, you know, these are the, vi the environmental settings we will have. And in here we can set a database, okay? So you can see here the database name um, is called Homestead. Well, we're gonna go ahead and create a database. All right, now you do need to have a database to continue forward. Um, it's going to be important. And so what I need you guys to do so what I need you guys to do is make sure you have MySQL installed on your computer. I'm not gonna do an extensive tutorial, but I'll give you a quick overview on how to do it, all right? Because um, I think a lot of you already have it installed, 
And so I don't want to waste a ton of time going into detail. But what you need to basically do is um, come here to mysql.com and you need to install, click on downloads. Okay, and then you're gonna come down here and you're gonna install the community edition of, um, of MySQL, okay? Come down here, you'll have MySQL community server. You're gonna click on this and then you're going to install it from here. So you're gonna choose your, you obviously just choose your platform. I'm on Mac OS X and then you're gonna go ahead and save. I prefer the DMG archive, whatever you like, it doesn't really matter, it's all the same. By the end, it's all the same, so it's just how you're gonna decompress it. Um, this is kind of the default that Mac uses, though. You're gonna want 64-bit, the DMG archive, click download, it's going to save that. It has a little installer, you install it like you normally would, um, and then what it's gonna do is after you're done installing, you're going to come up to your system preferences, okay? So come from the Mac down to system preferences, and you're gonna see you're gonna have a little item here that says MySQL. You're gonna to wanna to click that and you're gonna to wanna to make sure that MySQL is running. And I like to check this little box that just says automatically start MySQL at startup. It just has it running in the background. You don't have to be coming in here. If you don't have this checked, you're just gonna to wanna to click this button right here to set that's gonna say start MySQL server. This will say running and then it will change to stop and I could stop it if I wanted. But I recommend just clicking start and then clicking this automatically start at startup as well. Okay, now MySQL is running in the background. You know what though? We're not going to, now if you wanna use the command line, you can. Because it's a beginner's tutorial, we're not going to use the command line because I don't wanna confuse you guys too much. What we're gonna do is, if you're on Mac, we're gonna come over here to SQLite and, um, not SQLite, I'm sorry. Um, shoot, what is it called? SQL Pro, it's called SQL Pro. Um, there we go, so you're gonna look up SQL Pro and this is a GUI application that allows us to access our database um, through like a graphical interface. So you can see here, MySQL, it's a uh, database management for Mac. If you don't have this, an alternative for PC is just at mysql.com, you can use the MySQL Workbench. Um, come down to Downloads, and right here, MySQL Workbench. It must be under Community. Here it is. Okay, so MySQL Workbench is what you're gonna want. You're gonna wanna go ahead and download this, and it's another alternative for, um, it's on all the platforms. So Microsoft Windows, it also is on, um, it's on Mac as well. I prefer if you're on Mac to use SQL Pro. It's a lot easier and it's cleaner and stuff like that. So um, you're gonna go ahead and just download this. It stores just like an application, so you're gonna move it over to your applications folder, okay? So that should get us up and running with MySQL. So let's go ahead, I'm actually gonna close this and open up my applications folder and we're gonna come down to SQL Pro. This is what it looks like. It's a uh, database with like, kinda looks like a stack of pancakes, right? And, um, oh, it's over here on my other monitor. And this is what we're going to end up with. This is what you're gonna get when you start. So what we need to do is create a database and by to create a database, we need to connect to our local MySQL instance. Okay, so you can see I've already created a favorite called localhost, and this makes it really easy to connect to my database. All I need to do is click the blue button here to connect. However, you're not gonna have that if you just barely installed um, SQL Pro. So let me show you how to connect to the MySQL that we just installed. Um, this is how you connect to it on your computer. What you're gonna do is you're gonna create a favorite, and this makes it easy so that when you you don't want to type this in every time you launch the application. You can have it set up like I do, where I just boot the application and click connect. But you're gonna create a new favorite. So you're gonna click this plus icon here. You're gonna change, okay, we'll name the favorite. Let's call it localhost, just like I did. And then you're going to change this up here, this tab to socket, and the username to root, okay? So it's gonna be localhost and then root. And then you are going to just click um, add to favorites. Now I've already got a local, so it won't, won't work, but add to favorites, if you don't click this and you just click connect, it won't save it. So you click add to favorites, so it saves it over here, and then um, and then you're gonna connect. Once we connect, you're going to be able to access all your databases. To access those, you're gonna come up here to the top where it says choose database, and you can see I already have, I've got four databases created already, and then you're gonna have some of these other ones which are just kind of built. Um, built into MySQL. We're creating a new database, right, just for this application. We're gonna call it blog. 
So we're going to create add database. So we're gonna click choose database, add database. It gives us our database name, keep everything else just default, let it be that way, and we're gonna call it blog. And then click add, and now we've got a blog database. So you can see up here it says blog, but we have no tables, and that's okay. We're gonna let Laravel create the tables, okay? Normally your tables will be selected down here. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just close this, and we're gonna come back over here, and you can now see that it says DB database, and the database is, um, is going to be called blog. That's what we just created. The database host is 127.0.0.1. Okay, that should be what it is. And then um, the username is going to be root and the password is going to be blank. And this is the default MySQL settings, okay? The default. Now, once you connect this to the internet, you're gonna have, you're gonna actually put in real passwords and real settings, but these settings here, right here, will let you connect to your database that's on your computer, okay? Which is what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be saving to a database that's on our computer for now, okay? So that's all we need to do for here. Go ahead and just save this. And then we're going to also come up to config and database. Now this lets us change the settings for our database. You can see in here we've got different types of databases that we can work with. We can connect with um, SQLite, we can connect with MySQL, we can connect with uh, PostgreSQL or SQL Server from Microsoft. So um, we're gonna be using MySQL. We don't actually need to change any of these. I just wanna show you if you needed to where you would change them. You can see here that the driver is MySQL. That's just something Laravel's got built in. The host is the environmental variable called DB host. And the default, if it's not set, is localhost. Now, if we go back to our invi these, this envir env thing is our um, environmental file. So it knows to go to that .env file and look for the item saved DB host. And so if we go over here, you can see DB host. This is what the item will be. So 127.0.1, that is what it will, um, so the host will become 127.0.1. Um, database, it does the same thing for our database name, our username, and our password. And all of those we just saved in here, okay? So that's what's happening behind the scenes. Now you could obviously connect with other databases other than MySQL um, if you wanted. Laravel supports that, but we're gonna be using MySQL because it's kind of the easiest to work with and it, Laravel supports it out of the box, okay? Now it's time to see if we got this working. So we're gonna actually create our migration. So this is the moment of truth, guys. So just recapping, make sure you create your database, okay? Not the tables, but the database. You need to have that already set up and you need to take that database name and you need to store it in this .env file, okay? So this is the database name. And then by default, you'll save your root, your username and your password. And by default, the default password on a MySQL database is um, blank and the default username is root okay and that's all it is and you you know that because if we go back over to our SQL Pro and I'm gonna close this connection and reopen it and um, you know if we I have two now that's great uh, remove delete okay so if I go to our default one you can see that how are we connecting to it well root and no password right so that's how we know it's working so you're basically gonna tell it to connect just like you connected here. Let's go back over here. Okay, so now we should be all set up. Laravel should be able to talk to our database. Let's tell it to run the migrations so it can create those tables. We need our terminal in order to do that. Let's open up our terminal. You also need to make sure you're in your folder or the C, the PHP artisan won't work. So you need to go CD sites and then CD blog. Um, and now we're in our Laravel folder. So everything should work. So now we're gonna do PHP artisan migrate and click enter. Okay, so um, you can see here that it created a migration table successfully. We're gonna look at that in a second. It migrated our create users table. It migrated our create password resets table and it migrated our create posts table. Okay, so it's created, it's saying I've done everything. Here we go. So what we wanna do now is I'm gonna go over to SQL Pro we're gonna go over to this application and take a look at the work it just did. Now let's go ahead and select our database, blog. And you can see now that we have four tables, all right? So let's take a look at this. It says migration table created successfully. 
Well, you can see here that there's a table called migrations. And migrations is how Laravel keeps track of what it's done and what it hasn't done. So it's saying, okay, I, I process this migration. Remember this file name? It corresponds with Laravel. It created it in the first batch. Um, this, this one and this one. So it created all three of these in one batch. So now if it needs to go back a batch, it knows to do all three of those together. You can see here it said created the create users table. It created that. We have a users table. Let's take a look. Sure enough, we have an ID, a name, an email, a password, the remember token, and then the created at and updated at. So it worked. Um, if we click on structure here, we can see a little bit more. We can see that the ID is an integer. The name is a var car with a maximum 255. The email is a var car 255. The password is the var car 60. All these should look familiar, guys, because you um, if we go to our database migrations and click on the users, remember, I mentioned earlier, by the way, a string is 255 character varkar unless you tell it otherwise, because that's the maximum that a string can be. Um, but So these are all 255 varkar, 255 varkar. This one is unique. The email is unique. And so we should see here that um, email, and you can see that it's it's key is unique. So it's got the UNI here, which means unique. Um, and then you can see here that we've created a password that is a varkar with 60. And sure enough, password varkar 60. And then it's got a remember token and a timestamps. So the remember token is a varkar 100. And it allows null. Okay. So because you're not always going to have a remember token. So it allows null. And that's what this checkbox is here. And then we created created at and updated at, and both of those are timestamps. And um, yep, so th that's what those are, and those have a default of basically an empty timestamp, so that you know that they're empty. Okay, so that's what Laravel created for us for our users table. We've got our password resets table as well, um, email token and created at, and then we've got our posts. So our post has our ID, our title, our body, and then our timestamps. Once again, it created it just like we would have hoped. Let's go ahead and look at the content. This is where you would normally see your rows of data, but we don't have any yet. But you can see that we've kind of got that spreadsheet format. Okay, so we've gone ahead and we've now created all of the, um, we've created our structure to start storing our database. So in the next video, it's time to actually start using Laravel to create a form so that we can actually start writing a blog post and saving it to the database so that it gets saved in this posts as a new entry. And then in the videos after that, we'll actually start pulling them out of the database and outputting them to the user to start creating a functional blog, uh, blog system. So guys, we're really close. Please stay tuned and um, keep up to date. Subscribe below if you have not subscribed so you can get these updates when they happen. Trying to release one video a day for this series um, and sometimes it's one video a day, sometimes it takes two days to make one. So just hang tight guys, I'm working hard. But um, I hope this is exciting guys. We're making massive progress. All right guys, see you later.